So a couple of notes that uh, that I thought of that we, after we went over to our speakers this morning was one, and Mr. McGinnis didn't mention this, but I know this is an option, is that for cutting down costs of transportation at schools, they buses are not that big of an issue, it's the driver. And at some of our schools, he's, he's left a bus there, and that bus is assigned to the school, it stays at the school, and they give that school a gas card. And so that, all their sports programs share the bus and the gas card, so they don't pay the dollar a mile. So they don't pay mileage, and they don't pay the driver, they just pay the gas. But he can't do that for everybody, and they can't have buses just sitting idly. You have to have a certain number of drivers at your school for him to agree to do that. So if you're thinking in, a, in one of your seasons where you have multiple drivers, that is available to where they give you a bus and a gas car. I mean, you can't get cheaper than that. That's the cheapest. What, 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 what did you just say? That you can get a bus and a gas car as an option. But you, they're not going to leave that there for one driver for one sport. But if you had multiple schools using it and sharing it, they would make that available. So check with him. Check with Jay and let him know you've got multiple drivers and multiple sports. And he'll let you know. There's only one driver. Sucker. All right. And then uh, on, uh, on the Title IX paperwork members, we've gotten everybody's in, and your athletic director's the one that sent that in. Everybody looks perfect. Uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunities for girls sports across our district. Every school's done a good job. Uh, the only thing is that on, on some of the numbers that are turned in, and just to be clear for everybody, is that whenever you're discussing Title IX numbers, it's not the number of uh, it's not necessarily cutting boys on a sports team doesn't help your Title IX members. So I've been in some conversations where a parent's been told that the coach cut boys because of Title IX. And that's the worst thing you can say, and it's not accurate to begin with. It should be accurate a long time ago. But now the Title IX numbers are based on the percent of females enrolled in your school. So if you've got 48% females in your school, and I'm not trying to give y'all a math question, but if there's 48% females in your school throughout the day, then there has to be 48% females in your athletic programs. And that's the measuring stick. So it's not, by, by cutting boys from a baseball team, it doesn't help your Title IX numbers because it's based on the percent. And then, uh, Another thing that needs to be mentioned is each of you got these little cards. These are the wet bulb globe cards. And these are the cards that throughout the summer while you're working on outside with your kids, we're using this as the measuring stick for extracurricular activities. And on this card, it doesn't have the descriptions of what you can do, but it's in one of your handouts how you'll modify your practice when you're in the yellow, modify it when you're in the red, and then when you're in the black that you don't practice. So these are wet bulb globe numbers. Every school has a wet bulb globe that your trainer uses. And if you're in football or cross country, you're going to need to check this wet bulb globe measurement throughout the summer because I know cross country is going to start running probably in July. So. Uh, if you're if you're doing any activities over the summer, make sure you get the wet bulb globe reading. Make sure you go to your chart and find out what you should do with your practice to modify it. Uh, so, in the last few years, it's very common in the summer for me to get a phone call where somebody has driven by where you're practicing, and they'll call and they'll be in their car and they'll tell me their name and they'll say, "I just drove by," and they'll name your school. And they said, that coach is out there practicing, and it's 97 degrees. And I'll have to explain to them, we don't go by the temperature, we go by the wet bulb globe, and it's the safest tool, and we have a process to go. So just let everyone know that, discussing with you, if it's 97, the wet bulb globe might be 89. 
it depends on if there's cloud cover, it depends on if there's wind blowing. So if you're working out this summer, use that color-coded chart. Make sure you check with your athletic trainer, check with your, your athletic director, and make sure that you get the wet bulb glow reading every day that you're working out outside. But we do have Mr. McGinnis as a school board attorney here. And Mr. McGinnis has been with the district a long time, and he's going to come up here and speak about uh, the Title IX audit that the district went through in the early 2000s. And he can speak firsthand of what they were looking for and some of the issues that were brought up. And then after that, Mr. McGinnis is going to speak to us about uh, what's called conflict of interest, where you in your job, where you you have a, you need to avoid what's called a conflict of interest where you're taking money. So Mr. McGinnis is our school board attorney, and so he's going to go up and go ahead and take care of this part of the agenda. I appreciate the chance to come out and talk with you about these two topics today. Um, they're, they're probably not the most exciting things that you've talked about all day, but they're certainly very important. And the goal of, of going over both Title IX and particularly the conflict of interest material is just to give you a heads up and kind of a base of knowledge so that you realize these issues are out there. You realize that you need to be alert when these issues pop up. But in our, in, in, I'm not going to try to teach you all the details of these two today because we've got staff in Mr. Humphrey's office, in my office. If you have an issue with any of these areas, if you call his office, we'll look at the facts of your situation and give you advice and help you work through it. So today's goal is just to make you aware that these matters are out there and uh, hopefully avoid problems that could come up in either of these areas. I'd like to start with Title IX. And as uh, Brian said, back in 2001, uh, the district actually uh, was in a federal lawsuit sued over Title IX issues in athletics. Um, it was an experience that we certainly don't want to go through again. It was an experience that we learned a lot through. And what came out of that lawsuit that many of you may not know and, and people in the district may not remember if they haven't been here a long time is there was actually a uh, negotiated settlement agreement and that agreement is still valid today in the Oklahoma School District so as part of what I want to go over with you today uh, are those things that you particularly as athletic directors and then as individual coaches need to be aware of on your campuses and check to be sure we're still in compliance with these things that the district agreed to do uh, back in the early 2000s Title IX uh, originated in 1972. President Nixon signed it into law. Uh, it was the Title IX Education Amendments of 1972. It's a comprehensive federal law that has removed many barriers that once prevented people on the basis of sex from participating in educational opportunities and careers of their choice. So it's important to remember that under Title IX is primarily dealing uh, with educational type opportunities, but that, that's a, a big umbrella for a lot of things Title IX covers. For us today, we're only talking about the athletic portion of that. What the law says is no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So the way in which Title IX applies to our public school district and to public universities and other educational institutions is because we do receive a lot of federal money and federal funds into the school district for a variety of programs. And once we're the recipient of that type of federal funding, then Title IX is applicable to our programs. The, the Title IX law itself was patterned after the Civil Rights Act of 1964. They share a common purpose, and that is to ensure that public funds derived from all the people are not utilized in ways that encourage, subsidize, permit, or result in discrimination against some of the people. So that's kind of the basic root of what Title IX is all about. How does it apply to athletics? The department uh, of education uh, adopts regulations that implement Title IX. So you've got the law out there and then you've got all these regulations that tell us what, you know, what the law means and what it does. 
In their Title IX regulations, they prohibit sex discrimination in interscholastic, intercollegiate, club, or intramural athletics offered by a recipient institution. And our public school district is a recipient institution. And it's in respect to three areas. Discrimination is prohibited in student interest and abilities, in athletic benefits and opportunities, and in athletic financial assistance. Now at the K-12 level, the financial assistance part doesn't apply to us, but that would apply at college and university levels. So let me go through those two prongs that apply to us under the regulations. The first is student interest and abilities. So under this part of the regulation, the Office of Civil Rights, which is a division of the U.S. Department of Education, they're the ones that investigate Title IX complaints. They use a three-prong test to determine whether an institution is providing non-discriminatory athletic participation opportunities in compliance with the Title IX regulations. And they do this, they've created what they consider to be a flexible test to determine from the standpoint of offering and participation for athletes if we're in compliance. So a district like ours has to meet at least one of these standards. You don't have to meet all three, but you've got to meet one of them. The first standard they look at is whether participation opportunities for male and female students are provided in numbers substantially proportionate to the respective enrollment. Now that's what Mr. Humphrey just talked about. It's looking at the proportion of your enrollment, male and female, and then how your athlete uh, numbers are lining up. Or they look at whether the members of one sex have been and are underrepresented among your athletes and whether the institution can show a history and continuing practice of program expansion which is designed to respond to the developing interests and abilities of the members of the underrepresented sex. The third thing they look at would be where the members of one sex are underrepresented among your athletes and the institution cannot show a history of continuing practice or program expansion, can the institution show that the interest and abilities of members of the underrepresented sex have been fully and effectively accommodated by your present program? So there's three separate ways that OCR will look at our numbers to determine if we're in compliance of that piece of the regulation. So that's why you do your reports annually and the district has to submit an annual report outlining our numbers and our teams. And I just wanted you to understand why we're doing that because that's part of the federal regulation that they look at. Now, the other area that applies to us of those three is under the area of athletic benefits and opportunities. And this part of the regulation requires that we provide equal athletic opportunity for members of both sexes. Now let me clarify that, that part when we're talking about equal. It does not mean that we have to provide exactly the same services or equipment, but it does mean that both male and female athletes receive equal treatment overall. So when OCR is looking at a district to see if they're in compliance with this part of Title IX, these are the elements they will come in and look at. And these are the things that were looked at in this district in early 2000 when we were in that matter. Number one, they look at these factors. The provision of equipment and supplies. Number two, the scheduling of games and practice time. Number three, travel and per diem allowances. Number four, opportunities for coaching and academic tutoring. Number five, assignment and compensation of coaches and tutors. Number six, provision of locker rooms and practice facilities and competitive facilities. Seven, provision of medical and training facilities and services. Eight, which would apply more to universities, housing and dining services. Nine is publicity. Ten is recruitment and 11 is support services. Now, the department realizes for instance, in the area of equipment and supplies, they realize that not every uniform is going to cost the same. They know that certain uniforms, because of their design and their function, depending on what the sport is, may cost more money than others. So there's not a requirement that you spend exactly the same amount of money, 
for instance, on football uniforms as you might spend on swimsuits for a swim team, but what you cannot do is discriminate in the quality of the uniforms you're buying. You can't buy high quality men's team uniforms and low quality female team uniforms. And you can't discriminate in the number of uniforms or uniform parts that you provide. For instance, you can't provide just two men's teams, a game day uniform for home, an away game uniform, and a practice day uniform, and then not provide those similar kinds of uniforms for some of the female teams. So when we're looking at things like uniforms, we're talking about being fair and non-discriminatory regarding quality and quantity. Now I want to go over with you some specific provisions out of the Federal Lawsuit Settlement Agreement that apply district-wide. And I would ask that all the athletic directors in the room please assess your schools and your facilities to be sure that you're still in compliance with these standards. So these are things we agreed the entire school district would ensure are in place. Number one, we agreed the district would maintain a system of sport by sport accounting for revenues and expenditures accounted for in your school internal accounts for each male and female team in accordance with the accounting guidelines of the Red Book which applies to Florida educational institutions. So there should be at your school uh, some accounting so that we, we could find out the amounts of funds that are being com coming in and being spent by various teams. The second thing is we agreed that uniforms for male and female sports teams would be comparable in both quality and quantity. Uniforms for a team of one gender shall not be replaced on a more frequent basis than uniforms for a team of the other gender for the same sport. So if you've got a schedule where you're replacing men's basketball uniforms, you need to be sure that the ladies' basketball uniforms are on the same rotation schedule for replacement. The same would apply to any other sport you have where you have both a male and female team. The limitations we agreed on uniform replacement uh, will not interfere with any replacements that is necessitated by issues of safety or wear and tear. Those are left to the team's coach to make a final decision. Also, the district's policy of passing uniforms down from one level team to another, instance from varsity to junior varsity, shall be the same for all teams. So if you have a practice in your school of passing down team uniforms, be sure that all of your teams are following that same standard. If athletic <coughs> shoes or socks are subsidized or provided to the team of one gender at a school, the district will ensure that athletic shoes or socks are provided for a substantially equivalent number of athletes on a team of the other gender. So be sure you're checking on that if that's something you're providing. If a school provides uniforms with participant names, with your school logo, with a team name, or with numbers that are stitched on for one gender of teams, then it will provide uniforms with those same things, participant name, logos, team names, numbers and stitch lettering on the uniforms for a team of the other gender. Now when they came in to do the investigations during that litigation, I remember clearly that uniforms was a really big deal in, in part of that claim. And so what, what happened was we went over one day, used the gym at Choctaw, and we set out long tables around the entire gymnasium, and we had every school bring in samples of their various team uniforms and lay them all out and it got down to the point that literally people were checking the fabric the thickness the quality they were checking to see if numbers and names had been stitched on or had been just ironed on and that was the comparison that was going on so it gets that detailed if you get a claim like this that's what people are going to be looking at so you just need to be alert at your school about those those facts when you deal with any team with uniforms. Now the settlement agreement does say that a coach has the final decision as to whether or not they want stitched lettering or stitched numbering on uniform tops. There were some female coach 
coaches that said for their female teams, because of the particular use of the, the uniform uh, or the way the ladies wore the uniform, they did not want the thick, heavily stitched lettering and numbering on those shirts. And that's fine. If, if the coach decides that's what they want, then the settlement agreement says that's okay. We'll go by the coach's decision. The next item that, that was agreed to and that you still need to be following today is the district agreed that it would ensure that all weight rooms in the district have dumbbell weights in the following ranges, two, three, five, eight, and 10 pounds. The district also agreed that it would ensure that the schedule for the use of those weight training facilities would be provided in an equivalent fashion to both male and female teams. This is, of course, again, in accordance with the coach's training regimen or decision. If a coach chooses not to have their team work in the weight room, that's fine. It's just that for every team, male and female, where the coach wants access to the training and weight facilities, you've got to be sure you make those schedules so that both groups can adequately use the facilities. The next item dealt with pregame meals. And in this situation, what we realized is that for many teams, they have parent groups that are funding the pregame meal. Uh, they may have a, a restaurant that is providing uh, something, you know, just for a particular team. So the agreement was, and this is what you should follow today, the school district would ensure that if pregame meals were provided to any male athletes, except at private homes, or elsewhere when funded by the athletes' families, so that's an exception to the rule. Meals of substantially equivalent quality and frequency will be provided to a similar number of female athletes. And the district agreed that it would ensure that at any school where on campus facilities were made available for these meals, that those facilities would be made available fairly and equally between both male and female teams. So if your cafeteria is used to feed one of your teams, you just need to be sure that it's available to feed female teams as well. All teams should have equal access to our facilities for this pregame meal purpose. The next item we dealt with were baseball and softball fields. And there was a lot to do with baseball and softball fields. We were looking at things such as uh, flagpoles. Many baseball teams had a flagpole, many softball, I'm, I'm sorry, fields had a flagpole, many softball fields did not. And so we agreed that these fields would be maintained and taken care of in an equal basis. So for instance, for your fields, if you have bleachers on your baseball field, you've got to provide bleachers on the softball field. Now we agreed specifically in a separate section to the issue of bleachers. They can be provided using portable bleachers that the district of the school may have that can be moved seasonally. But during the seasons, you have to ensure bleachers are available on softball fields for their uh, spectators and fans. Also, I remember on, on baseball and softball fields, there was an issue of uh, wind screening. So if your baseball field had wind screening around the outfield fence, you need to be sure your softball field has wind screening. If your baseball field has those uh, vinyl or rubber protective barriers along the top of the fences going out to the outfield, you need to be sure the softball field has those kind of protective barriers. Some of the fields had uh, either first base or third baseline distance markers for, I guess, to tell how far you had hit or how long, how long the line is. If you've put those distance markers up on the baseball field, you need to put them up on the softball field. Then we agreed separately that softball teams would be allowed to solicit and display advertising in accordance with the school board's advertising policies on the perimeter fencing of their softball fields. Uh, in that time, way back then, in making inspection visits, many baseball fields had signs all the way around the outfield fence and there were not a lot of softball fields that had those. This is not saying that you have to have it, it's saying that you have to provide that opportunity. You have to allow the softball teams 
to raise those funds and solicit advertisers and put advertising on their fences just as you do your baseball fields. And then as I mentioned already in regard to bleachers, we simply agreed that bleachers would be provided at every softball field to adequately seat the spectators and that that seating could be accommodated by portable bleachers that could be relocated at the conclusion of the competitive season. So please ensure that you're doing that. I remember as well there was an issue of uh, concession facilities and we had to ensure that if we had a concession stand at the baseball field that there were arrangements made for concessions to be available for the softball field. For a long time that was done with a set of uh, portable trailers that the district had purchased for that reason. They were moved around during different seasons, but just be sure you're dealing with concessions uh, equally for both. The point of all this is just to be sure, as I said, the law doesn't require exact treatment. It requires fair and equitable treatment. And so you need to be analyzing your programs and your facilities to be sure that you're doing that. A final thing we agreed to, and I, I wouldn't have thought this it would have been an issue, but it was, we agreed that schools would maintain a policy of ensuring equal access to sports drinks during competitive uh, games and practices for both male and female teams. So, you know, you can't just have one team out there that's always got plenty of beverage or whatever. You've got to be sure that all the athletes and all the teams have access to those type uh, beverages during the game. Of course, the coach can control what they feel like, you know, that they want their athletes to have for games and practices. Now those are the standards I've read you out of that lawsuit, and if you think about it, when you look at this gender equity form that Mr. Humphrey talked about, they're pretty much all covered here. And so that's why I'm asking you to go back and be sure you're following these standards because there's a place on this form that's making you check off whether or not you are in compliance, and we certainly want every school to do that. That's kind of the summary I want to give you about Title IX. Are any questions about Title IX? Okay, let me move into the next area of conflict of interest. The point of this presentation, once again, is just to alert you to these possibilities and to help you keep yourself and your other coaches out of any kind of trouble with either the Florida Commission on Ethics or the school board if there should be a disciplinary problem. You know, if, if you get yourself into a conflict of interest situation as an employee of the district or a supplement employee of the district, it certainly can have a negative impact on your employment and the state can get involved as well and we don't want that to happen to you so that's why I want to go over these matters. What we've developed are some scenarios that I'll, I'll read to you uh, and then and give you the suggested answer to whether or not a conflict exists but primarily what we're talking about here is a conflict that's created because you as a coach and in most cases also a teacher if you're involved in any kind of outside activity that you would want athletes to be participating in, such as a summer camp, travel ball, uh, private lessons, anything where you might be paid individually by that student or their family for those services, there are ethics opinions out there that restrict when you can do that and when you can offer and market those services. And that's what's so important to understand. So that's what I want to go over with you. Now, the first one I'll deal with, and if you have this handout, I'm, I'm dropping down to uh, number three. The first hypothetical is, does a conflict of interest exist when the school's coach requires students to purchase their uniforms or shirts from him or her or from a company that he or she benefits from financially? I hope you all would understand the answer to that question would be yes. A prohibited conflict of interest would exist if any of you as a coach required that kind of purchase by your athletes. The next scenario is a swimming instructor who is not a school employee but is hired by parents to give students swimming lessons is later hired by the school to be the swim coach. 
Is there a conflict of interest if students who are in the school's swim team are also playing, paying for swimming lessons by that coach? Now, when the person was not employed as the swim coach at the school, there's certainly no issue of them giving private swim lessons to people at the school because they're not related to the school or to the team in any way. But the moment that that outside individual got hired to be the swim coach at the school, that changed. Their relationship changed because now they're coaching a team at the school over which they have influence, over which they are selecting team members, over which they're selecting who starts and who doesn't start, and that's what changed everything for that person. There's an opinion out there, and it's the same opinion we'll use to answer the rest of the scenarios I'll give you, and I, want to, I just want to read the paragraph from that opinion for you. The Ethics Commission in Florida has said, a public school teacher or coach is not prohibited from privately tutoring or providing supplemental instruction to public school students or from offering private summer programs to students provided that the students tutored, instructed, or offered the programs, and this is the key, it starts out by saying you're not prohibited, but then the catch is provided that these things don't exist, and these are provided that the students being tutored, instructed, or offered the programs are not students on the coach's team at the time the instruction is offered or carried out. They are not in the coach's classes. They're not in group instruction. They're not going through sports tryouts. And once again, not on the team. At the time you offer the tutoring or the lessons or the camp, or at the time you actually perform the tutoring or give the lessons or have the camp. So it's a two-pronged test. You cannot offer or solicit or market your athletes to be in your summer camp during a time while you're still in season with them on your team or if you're a classroom teacher during the school year while they're still in your classroom. Because once again, what the Ethics Commission is concerned about is undue influence that you might have over that student causing them or their families to pay you private money for these lessons or to go to these camps. And so that's why you have to be so careful that if you're still in season with your team or if you're teaching in the classroom, you can't be offering or passing out flyers or telling people about your camp or your private lessons and how much it's going to cost. That would create a conflict of interest for you. And so this scenario is to show you how someone can go from being an individual unrelated to the school to having some relationship to the school and it changes what they can or can't do with those students. The next scenario, a school's volleyball coach is not an employee of the school except for the volleyball position that they hold and perform after the school day. So that means to me they're a supplemented a, a coach. Is there a conflict of interest if he or she invites the school's volleyball players to play on his or her traveling club, which students must pay to be a part of, if the seasons don't overlap? Well, going back to the Commissioner of Ethics opinion, it's not really whether the seasons overlap, it's when, when are you going to invite them to be on that travel team? Because if, if volleyball is still going on and this coach is coaching volleyball, the coach cannot be talking about or marketing or giving out brochures about their volleyball travel team because they still have the season going on, they're still coaching, they still have some control and authority over these players. So in that situation, it would be a conflict of interest if that coach did that during the volleyball season. The next scenario, a school's basketball coach is also a PE teacher at the school and has provided a six-period basketball class for their basketball team. Is there a conflict of interest if he or she invites the school's basketball players to play on his or her traveling club team, which the students must pay to be a part of, if the seasons don't overlap? Now this one has to be analyzed in two ways. 
not only do we look at the person as a coach, and we know the standards I've already laid out for you as a coach. It can't be during the season of your team, and you can't offer or market your program during the season of your team. Secondly, though, we have to look here because this is not just the basketball coach. This person is also a PE teacher. So the basketball season may be long over, but that PE class may still be going. So for this individual, they cannot offer the clinic, offer the travel team, or provide the clinic or the travel team, not just during their basketball season, but during the rest of the school year while they are still teaching that PE class if those students are involved. That's the difference in that scenario, so you have to realize, and I think for many of you, you would be in that same position. You probably have a teaching job as well as your coaching job. So you're not just looking at when does your competitive season end for your team. You've got to remember, wow, but I'm all, I've got this six-period basketball class for the rest of the year, so I can't be getting involved in marketing a travel team or getting paid for these things while that's going on. The next scenario, a school's baseball coach is a math teacher. So an academic course totally unrelated to athletics. A math teacher at the school who performs his or her baseball coaching duties after the school day. Is there a conflict of interest if he or she invites the school's baseball players to play on his or her traveling club team, which the students would pay to be a part of if the seasons do not occur or overlap at the same time. The point of this hypothetical is to tell you it's not just if you're teaching PE or basketball for the same team you're coaching. This is a math teacher who is also the baseball coach. The answer is still the same. Just because you're teaching kids in a math class doesn't mean you can go in and offer them a chance to be on your baseball travel team because you're thinking, well, I'm teaching them math. That's got nothing to do with baseball. You're still teaching them. So for this particular teacher, as long as that math class is still in session, they cannot be soliciting those students in that math class to be part of a travel team, nor can they solicit their baseball team members during the baseball season to be part of that team. Finally, a school's basketball coach tells his or her players at the end of the season, that it's important for them to maintain and continue to improve their skills. The coach went on to say that he or she expected all of the players to sign up to play on his or her traveling club team, he expected them to sign up. The fee to play was only going to be $100 a month. Now this has several problems to it. First, we already have been over and over again you know, you can't be offering during the season. You can't be providing the service during the season to your team. This is a bigger problem for this particular employee. They have now used their position of authority to say to these team members, I want you to keep your skills up over the summer, and I expect you to sign up for my travel team. They have just used their position with the district for personal gain, and also have improperly influenced or tried to influence those students. That's a whole another series of ethical problems and violations of policy. So that person has committed not only an issue with, with when they're offering or when they may be giving the, the, uh, the travel team coaching, they have used their position for an improper purpose to try to influence those students. And, and, and what you have to realize is what I don't think people understand once as a coach you say anything like that, you know, I really want you to join my travel team if you want to keep your skills up for next year, you wait until you get to next year and the tryout start. And then that player doesn't make the team. And then that parent calls the district office and says, wait a minute, we didn't have the money to pay for that travel program all summer and that coach said that they really wanted every athlete to sign up for that program. So we think that those that didn't sign up and didn't pay were cut from the team. It's very hard for the district to defend an allegation like that if a coach has said something like that. So please just don't make those kinds of statements that are gonna come back to haunt you and haunt the school and the district in another season. Um, do you have any questions for me on the, on the conflict scenarios? Once again, the goal is simply to make you aware 
that you have to be careful in those situations. Please don't get yourself in one of these boxes. If you have a question, and, and Brian and I get these questions frequently, call us ahead of time. If you're considering participating with giving a camp or some kind of lessons or some kind of program, just call us before you start. Let us look at it with you. Let us go through the facts with you, and we'll give you advice to try to keep you from getting yourself into any kind of a troublesome situation. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to touch base on what we're doing on this pre-concussion test and the baseline test, just to clear it up with everybody, is, uh, you know, this June, the Andrews Institute will offer that baseline test in each one of your schools. So it's free, and we require every parent or every athlete to at least have a form, and I don't have the MIS form with you, but it's in your packet. We at least require a form to be in the student's athletic packet where the parent either checks yes, I want the baseline testing, or no, I do not want it. We have very, very few parents check no. Almost every parent checks yes. I'd say 99% are checking yes. I have seen a few where the, the student packet has no mark. Um, if they mark yes, we either need to kind of get them this summer to the baseline test at the schools, but if they miss that, then they would do the impact test on the computer where you, you, you can bring kids in the computer lab, they all log in and hit those buttons, you know, based on the pictures that they see. So either it's it's either do the CX3 logic test over the summer with Andrews, or we do the impact test, which we need to have one, if they parent mark yes. And so every year, every year for the last three years, we've had an injury where a student goes down, and the student goes down with a possible head injury, and um, the, the parent mark yes, the doctor will ask if it's available and they request it and we don't have it because the, the school never gave the kid the baseline test even though the, the parents mark yes. It's kind of like we're, we're, we're volunteering to do it so we have to do what we volunteer to do. So we are going to continue to volunteer to do it. So just make sure that every kid has that if the, if the parents mark yes. And then if it does happen where you have a head, head injury and the student does go down and the, the doctors request it, we can get either the CX3 logic results, the Andrews Institute is going to share that freely. They'll send it to the doctor for you. All we got to do is request it. And then if it's not, if it's the impact one, all you got to do is email me or, or go through your trainer and we'll, we'll log in and print it out and we can share that with the doctor. Either test will share with any doctor that's out there that the, that the student goes and sees. So just know that if, if the parent marks yes, you've got two options on the baseline test. They can do the, the six three logic or the, the, the one where we uh, log on the computer. If you do the impact test, uh, then the difference for me is we, we pay for the impact test. It costs about $4 a test. So, you don't have to get baseline test every kid that tries out. So I know some of y'all may have 80, 90 kids try out for a sport. And if only 20 of them are making it, you can just collect their paperwork, make sure they have a physical turned in, make sure they have a parent permission form turned in, and let them go through the tryout. Once they make the team, then call your team in and, and put them in a room and, and we'll make sure they all have impact testing. But they definitely need it once you pick your team to make sure that we've had that because you can get a head injury in practice the same as a, as a game. So is there any questions on the baseline test for the uh, uh, impact or the? Yeah, if they do it this year, they don't have to do it next year, is that right? The, the test results are good for two years. And so some schools have a system where they're doing ninth graders and 11th graders. Uh, but yeah, some, someone at your school, either your trainer or athletic director is keeping a list and somehow you just got to keep up with whose is expiring and whose is not. I can shoot you a list for the impact test ones and the dates if you need. You just shoot me an email and ask 
and there's a website that I can go to log in and print your schools out uh, if you need that information. But yeah, they're, they're good for two years. Has anybody else got a question on the baseline test? Everybody, everybody's good with that? Okay. Um, also in your handout is a, uh, in your packet is a, a sample heat chart index uh, I meant to point out is uh, over the summertime and going into the fall, if you have your athletic trainer or your coaches share that wet bulb blow thermometer, they're, they're kind of expensive, but there's no need to have more than one as long as you get a reading somewhere on your campus and share that with the cross country coach. But if you'll log it somewhere, it, it will help you in case something happens. You know, we hope nothing bad happens, but we always kind of try to prepare for that. If something bad was to happen, we would like to log in that we are monitoring uh, the weather conditions over the summer and in the fall when it's severe heat. So if, if at any time you'll take the wet bulb blow, either you do it with a trainer, just document, like keep a journal of what you're reading or finding. Any questions on that? Yeah. Is that wet bulb thing? Uh, yeah, that uh, also with the lightning safety, in other words, can we download an app to our phones for... No, that would be nice. But uh, the wet bulb globe is not connected to anything. It's just a, a, an individual instrument that sits on a tripod. So at your school, if, you, if you're going to do act, outside activities over the summer, just get with your athletic director to make sure that they... And, and I think it's up to y'all have another weather system out there by the baseball field that y'all can use. Now that one is connected to a phone, is it not? So yeah, you may have that service at Choctaw, but not everybody has that weather station that's outside. So you may have that, but it's not those. Those uh, widgets is what the, the, the Geek Squad called them. Was, those were for uh, the lightning campaign. Didn't y'all with a... What call, what call? Yes. Each school should Every school has one. And it's on the tripod. Yeah. But there's no way to access the web reading from the internet. 